presentation to the board? Oh, okay. All right. We don't know that. Or we can stand there. I don't know. You should not ask me. Uh, so, uh, oh, there's your little box. Cool. Who did your video, by the way? Oh, the person who's not here, what's her name? Kelsey. Kelsey, yeah. That was rocking. Which one was it? Me. Yeah. Yeah. Hot yet? Ready to go? Okay. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to start the uh, meeting a bit early tonight. My name is Ken Luthi, and I'm the lead mentor for the SodaBots, um, one of our robotics teams here in the Tacoma area. And uh, this year we were, well, we're, we're successful every year for reasons other than the robot. But this year, uh, our robot was uh, the uh, captain of the winning alliance for the Pacific Northwest Division, which is about 160 teams. And we won that division this year and went on to Houston to be the uh, top alliance after qualification rounds there in our division, uh, which is really cool. <laughs> but uh, bigger than that is our team won for the uh, third time in four years the coveted Chairman's Award, which is for doing everything else but the robot uh, in terms of uh, spreading the word and getting the community interested in STEM careers. So our Chairman's team is up here right now and they're going to do their presentation to you and uh, enjoy. Hello, we are the SodaBots, FRC Team 2557 from Tacoma, Washington. My name is Addie, this is Q, and this is Milana. Our quest is to ready player two. Power up. In Mario Brothers video games, there are often two players. To play the game fully, both players need to have coordinated skills and proper training to be successful and win the game. Our team members are player one, enthusiastic student leaders. We share our passion for robotics with player two, the youth of today. Our mission is to ready these player twos to become player ones, the STEAM leaders of tomorrow. In 2007, the SodaBots was founded at the Tacoma School of the Arts on the belief that innovation thrives in an artistic and creative environment. This mindset of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, has been the foundation for our team for the past 11 years. Students on the SodaBots are trained with our well-established Jedi Padawan Mentorship Program, which reflects our quest to Ready Player Two. Jedis are the leaders of the team, teaching new students, or Padawans, technical skills and gracious professionalism, while introducing them to our strong volunteering culture. Over the past year, Padawans have joined their Jedis to clock over 2,000 hours of volunteering service. In <laughs> In 2009, the SodaBots co-founded the Tacoma Robotics Alliance, or TRA, as an open community resource to train player twos outside of our own team. This season, we ran our fifth annual FRC workshop designed to strengthen the technical knowledge and collaboration of the Pacific Northwest FRC community. Another contribution to this alliance is a full-size, up-to-spec practice field that we have run for every FRC season. The field is a supportive environment for teams across Washington to refine their robots and share ideas, tools, and mentors. The TRA has grown to connect 21 first teams, 
promoting camaraderie and friendship outside of competition. The soda bots are growing first in STEM in our local schools. This season, we started an FTC team at Jason Lee Middle School, giving the students the opportunity for project-based learning. We have also started six FLL teams, and we visit the many students on Fridays, laying the groundwork for them to compete next season. We are also assisting two new JFLL teams, the Light Up Team and the Mega Eagles, with a SodaBots alumna in Redmond. With members aged four to five, these are the youngest first teams ever. The SodaBots are leaders in the first community. We have been the event managers for the FTC Watt League and Interleague competitions for the past three years. We volunteer at every FRC event we attend, often setting up the field, taking it down, and doing everything in between. We come prepared with two extra tools and materials in case other teams need them, and we love to dance with others to the YMCA. In addition, the SodaBots organized a semi-truck and professional drivers to transport pit essentials for 14 FRC teams to the World Championships in Houston, Texas. That's nearly half of the qualifying teams from the Pacific Northwest. The SodaBots are advocates for increasing female participation in the FRC community. In the past two years, we have done a research project with the Girls First Initiative to collect, analyze, and share data on the gender demographics of the Pacific Northwest FRC community. Of the 68 teams that completed the survey this year, there was an average of only 31% girls on those teams, who are particularly underrepresented in the build, drive, and programming subteams. We also collected data on the tools teams used to recruit girls and have shared successful strategies at competitions throughout the season. On our own team, we are serious about female leadership. This past season, I was the, the electronics team lead. We decided to design the electronics panel in a new way this year with a two-tiered system to increase space and accessibility. Our programming team is 50% female, has a female team lead, and a positive culture that has made them very successful this year. By empowering girls and giving them leadership roles, our team has thrived, and we want to share our culture with others. The SodaBots are proud of our sustained connections with many Tacoma organizations. At the LeMay Car Museum, we regularly showcase our robots and facilitate engineering activities. We partner with the Tacoma Children's Museum and their preschool and introduce robotics to young player twos there every month. These relationships instill a lifelong passion for volunteering in SodaBots Player Ones. One of our strongest sustained volunteering commitments is connecting with the children and families at Marybridge Children's Hospital. Every two weeks, our members bring safe and engaging robots for the children at the hospital to play with. On one of my volunteering visits, I played with a young patient and her sister. They loved the Lego robots I brought, racing them down the halls and giggling so loudly that a nurse had to remind them to keep their voices down. For a little while, they were so happy to be entertained and distracted from their situation. The soda bots are growing first and STEM in new places throughout our broader community. We partnered to implement Camp Amazon, the first summer camp at Amazon's Robot Integrated Fulfillment Center in DuPont, Washington. We introduced STEM in unusual places, like a Tacoma Rainier's baseball game or a local farmer's market. We refurbished the playground at Marybridge Children's Hospital's on-site hotel. We starred in the Children's Museum's new film for their symposium for young citizens. We have formed new sponsor relationships with three local rotaries. The SodaBots are committed to connecting Tacoma youth with robotics and STEAM. In the past two years, we have visited 62 elementary and middle school classrooms and science fairs. We focus on t uh, reaching students from low-income neighborhoods, teaching them about the engineering process and affirming their love of science. During the summer, the SodaBots work with the Tacoma Public School District to help run the six-week Explore program. SodaBots members and alumni have taught over 3,000 third through eighth graders how to use LEGO programming to direct robots through different challenges. These camps have taught player twos to innovate, collaborate, and persevere, giving them skills to be successful in school. We are the SodaBots, and we are cultivating the next generation of thinkers, workers, and leaders. We are promoting FIRST and STEM to our teachers, our community, and our local government. Just as we have completed this cube, we are readying the player twos of today to power up 
and become the Player One STEAM leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, while the SodaBots are partners with FirstWA, um, the first robotics organization in Washington, robotics teams at the elementary, middle, and high school levels have a larger purpose. First robotics teams are platforms for students to gain skills in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Students in FIRST also develop skills in innovation, creativity, communication, and leadership, as well as working with industry mentors. We are building a, large, a larger pipeline for industry, teaching kids skills that every employer across Tacoma, Pierce County, um, and the state of Washington are seeking. After high school, students who have participated in FIRST Robotics programs are more likely to be accepted into college STEM programs, and graduates are currently employed in STEM industries. While our team great, uh, gratefully appreciates the school facilities we meet in, access to our workshop, and teacher mentors, we would like to ask for consideration of additional funding to be appro appropriated to robotics teams in the same way that funding is given for other sports teams in, uh, in other Tacoma Public Schools high schools. How many high school football players make a successful career on the playing field? Compare that with the percentage, uh, compare that percentage with the number of students that are directly employed in STEM fields after high school and college training. 88% of SodaBots alumni are employed, are employed in or studying STEM fields. We hope you can see the obvious benefit of investing equal, equally in robotics teams. The SodaBots want to expand this opportunity for engaging STEM education. This year, we will be including Roosevelt Middle School, Jason Lee, and Sherman. We are starting six FLL teams at Sherman Elementary in the fall. We even have funding secured for Stadium High School alumni for an FRC team there, and we want to work with the school in finding a teacher who will work with private industry mentors. We invite Tacoma Public Schools to foster the growth and sustainability of STEM throughout FIRST Robotics teams in Tacoma. As a starting point, our goal as the SodaBots is to help build FIRST programs at every school building in our district. The SodaBots and FIRST Washington are committed to making this happen, and we need your help to make this, sustainable, make this a sustainable reality. Thank you so much. Are there any questions really quick? Otherwise, yes. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Regular board meeting will begin in one minute.
good. Yeah, how's it going? Tired, but good. Yeah. Ready for summer. Definitely. One month left. Four of us. Yep. It's getting a little weird. I didn't see anyone's cars in the in the board members parking spots. Like, can I get the date wrong? Yeah. Yeah, I was here for like I was here like five minutes early, and they had like the soda box presentation. Kevin, can we have one minute just so people can come up to the dais, please? Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to call this Thursday, May 24th, meeting of the Tacoma School District Board of Directors to order. Please rise and join me for a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the general counsel please call the roll? Good evening, President Cobb. Here. Vice President Vial. Here. Director Winskill. Here. Director Leon. Here. And is Director Hines excused? Yes, I'm sorry. Nope. Yes, yes, he, he is. is. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Item number four, adoption of the agenda. I move adoption. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments about the agenda? All those in favor of adopting the agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 5.0, uh, 5 recognition of staff, students, and community. 5.1, recognition of the FOSS AFJROTC for receiving the Distinguished Unit Award and Outstanding Organization Award for 2017-18. Uh, thank you, President Cobb and members of the board. Each year, the headquarters for each of the military branches uh, sends out a representative to review their respective JROTC programs. The units must set and accomplish goals and demonstrate their excellence and service throughout the year. A very select few units receive the Distinguished Unit Award with merit, the Distinguished Unit Award, and the Outstanding Organization Award in a single year. This year, the FOSS IB World Schools JROTC program distinguished itself as one of the best of approximately 900 Air Force JROTC units worldwide. Let me just list a few of the accomplishments that they put together this year to, to earn this honor. They presented the colors at 11 different schools and a retirement center during Veterans Day week, as well as soccer, football, and basketball home games throughout the year. They participated in a community cleanup and multiple food drives. They presented at multiple funerals. They won numerous first and second place awards in league competitions. And now it's my pleasure to pre present to you Major Phillips, Master Sergeant Parks, and the members of the Distinguished Unit Award with Merit, the FOSS Air Force JROTC students. Thank you very much. It's, it's very nice to be here tonight. Uh, uh, we're honored to uh, accept this award. Uh, we've been here for years, and, and our goal has been, uh, and I'll be honest with you, uh, as we do this program, certain parts and I, this is a cadet-run program. If you want to see cadets run the program, run the school, uh, run our classes, you come see these ROTC cadets. So that's how we got that award. You know, we're, we're, we're more instrumental in, in guiding them, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, we're instrumental in, in maybe leading them the way they need to go, but they take charge and they do the job. With that being said, I'm going to ask our Vice Commander, Belladonna Root, to come up and uh, let her give a little spill here, and she'll take charge from here because that's what we do in the classroom. Bell, would you come forward, please?
Hello. I'm Cadet First Lieutenant Belladonna Root. Um, I'm part of the Henry Foss Air Force Junior ROTC program. I've been in the program for about three years. My freshman year, I wasn't really feeling it. I was, <laughs> I was pushed into it by my parents. I come from a military family. So I was not really feeling it. But over time, ROTC built me as a character. And it built me as a leader. And w I've gotten a lot of good recommendations for the jobs that I have because of ROTC. Um, getting distinguished unit was really difficult. Um, I have to say thanks to the current commander of that time, Ms. Kazaria Woods. Um, she really led that. She made the, the PowerPoints, the speeches, everybody's jobs. We put it together and we pulled through and it's really an honor. So thank you. I want to congratulate you all again and to thank um, the, the folks who are helping to guide you and become the young leaders that you are. So just congratulations. <laughs> so we will move on to item number 5.2, recognition of Gold Star Community Partner Award to Gordon Thomas Honeywell, partner Sal Mangia. Good evening, President Cobb and members of the board. Um, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the partnership office to help present uh, this month's Gold Star Community Partner Award. Tacoma Public Schools defines partnership as a cooperative relationship between students, families, schools, school districts, and the greater Tacoma community. Partners are committed to supporting student academic success and the whole child. Partners work with and invest in the education of our students whose future in turn will affect the community and the quality of life in our entire community. Uh, when it comes to student success, we know that schools cannot do it alone. And in recognition of that investment of time, talent, and resources um, on behalf of our students, families, and staff, the Gold Star Community Partner Award signifies uh, an honor and a thank you to a community partner who has made a difference by doing what is best for kids. To introduce our honoree is Sheridan Elementary Principal, Anna Griebel. All right, good evening. Uh, President Cobb and board, thank you for this opportunity to present and acknowledge um, some really great people doing good work in our schools. A couple of years ago, several years ago, Gordon Thomas Honeywell partner Sal Mangia had the idea to team up local businesses with elementary school students. Last summer, uh, Sal approached me with the concept and we worked together to design a pilot program for the 2017-18 school year. The idea was that great, uh, Gordon Thomas Honeywell employees would volunteer with first graders this year and then continue to support the same students as they continue on uh, through fifth grade and stay with them all the way through um, until they leave Sheridan. So this year, uh, Gordon Thomas Honeywell sponsored their attorneys and staff to volunteer in our first grade classrooms with the goal of improving academic and social skills of our first grade students, as well as providing support, encouragement, resources, and even field trips throughout the year. They even sent our first graders to Seattle to the University of Washington Law School, where the students were able to try the case of the bake sale, Bert and Ernie versus the Cookie Monster, under the direction of a real judge and a few law students in a real courtroom. It was an amazing opportunity. 
So this partnership enhances the education experience of our students by providing another layer of caring adults dedicated to helping children discover their own talents, imagine big dreams for themselves. Future classes are not going to be left out. Inspired by Sal's vision and positive impact, Columbia Bank has agreed to adopt our next year's first graders, um, beginning the second cohort of a sponsored volunteer program. On behalf of the Sheridan staff, students and families in Tacoma schools, we're grateful for Sal's vision and leadership and the dedicated presence of Gordon Thomas Honeywell team at Sheridan Elementary this year. Great. I think I get to present the award. President Cobb and board members, first of all, I say thank you on behalf of the firm, Gore and Thomas Honeywell. This is really special to us. But I will say this, and, and, I, and I know it's cliche, but sometimes cliches are cliches because they reflect reality. And let me tell you, I can speak for all of our volunteers who go out there. We have about 26, and then there's about five of us, six of us here tonight. And when we go out there, we get far more than what we can ever give. And we all will truly tell you that. And I know every single person who goes out there believes that. The, the reaction we get from the, these kids are, is just phenomenal. And I will just share one story. I've got a million stories, but I will just share one tonight. And she hasn't heard this, but it's Molly Vale. And Molly, will you raise up your hand? She's right here. So I was out there last week because I had to go up. When, when we can't go on our sign times, we go and make up the time. And, and I go out there, and, and this little girl comes up to me, and she goes, is Molly coming out today? And I go, oh, I'm sorry. No, she's not. It's just me today. She looks, she looks just crestfallen. <laughs> and in her little girl voice, she goes, will you tell her I miss her? I, I, when I got back to that firm today, I went right down to Molly's office. She wasn't there. So this is actually the first time that Molly's heard this. And, uh, but I have those stories and more for every single person behind me, for every single person at the firm. And we just want to say thank you uh, for this recognition. Thank you. As individuals in the community, we don't all, all get to see all the great things that adults are doing to support kids in the district, so I feel really privileged to sit up here and get to congratulate you all and thank you all for being such supports for our students. So again, thank you and we appreciate your partnership. Thanks. Okay, moving on to item six, the superintendent's report, and we have an update tonight on the Wallace Grant. So on behalf of the superintendent, we've asked uh, Director Laura Allen of our whole child and student life department to give you a brief update about our work that we're doing with the Wallace Foundation around social, emotional, and academic development. And so Ms. Allen? Thank you. Uh, this is a Wallace Grant five minute 101 for you all. As you know, we have in uh, Tacoma the Tacoma Whole Child Initiative, and so far we've been really strong in shift one of a four shift framework where we support students 24 seven throughout the day. We support their social, emotional, and academic development. Through the Wallace Grant, we are beginning to create systems and structures that will support students as they move into what we call expanded <laughs> learning opportunities. So that's opportunities to um, experience before school, at lunch, or after school programs that are both academic and non-academic. Through the Wallace Foundation, we are looking to um, align practice of adults in school and adults in after school programs all around social and emotional learning to improve the experiences of students. 
And those experiences are focused on these five castle competencies. So we have two that are internal, self-management, meaning that uh, we're able to set goals and achieve them, self-awareness, that we have an awareness of, about our emotions and our abilities, social awareness, we have an uh, ability to have empathy for others, relationship skills, that wonderful teamwork element, and responsible decision making, that we make ethical and productive choices uh, to lead the best lives we can. And I think as you look at these five competencies, if you think about the last 24 hours of your life, I'm sure both at home, in your personal life, and today at work, you've used all five of these at some point. So the Wallace Foundation originally looked at 145 cities. And through a exhaustive process that even involved uh, flying out and visiting different cities, it narrowed down and awarded nine planning grants. Those nine planning grants eventually uh, led to these six cities this year uh, beginning to implement the Wallace Grant. So we have uh, Denver, Boston, the Dallas, Palm Beach County, which has 180,000 students, Tulsa, that's not much bigger than us, and Tacoma, we are the smallest of the bunch. But we're not alone. We have some excellent partners in this endeavor. We have Schools Out Washington and Greater Tacoma Community Foundation, Graduate Tacoma UWT, and uh, Rand and Mathematica are supporting research and evaluation for all six sites. This is a long-term grant. We are currently in the yellow. This is this year, 1718, and we're going all the way through to 2023. So this year is all about readiness. We're getting some baseline data. We are building uh, systems to get ready for implementation. Next year, we will be doing explicit instruction at our Wallace site. So we're teaching social and emotional learning through lessons and also through signature practices in school and out of school. So let me give you an example. Um, when students walk into school, they're warmly welcomed. When they walk into the cafeteria, they're warmly greeted. When they walk into their classroom, they are. When they go into an after-school program, they're warmly greeted, they're seen, they feel like they belong. So we want these signature practices to weave throughout their day. And then in 2021 and 23 in the blue, our comparison sites will come online and implement and um, uh, begin instruction of social and emotional learning as well. So that is Wallace Grant in a nutshell, and uh, we will be sure to provide Friday reports and updates and celebrations in our data as we move through this process. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time, if there are any. Questions, Director Vial? I have a question, I, I just have a comment. Having been involved in this when it started at Board President, when we met over at Manitou School for two days to do, a, I guess, a collective impact, and they wanted to find out if we were for real. And that's kind of um, happened to have a family member who has some friends who work for the Wallace Foundation. They all went to Yale, so you know that's a little group back there, who said they could not believe a city our size could do what we were doing, a school district, and how we've gone through this process um, each step of the way and to the ability of us to respond and for them to continue to see the growth when this was our whole child initiative, what in the world is this going to be? And, um, you know, uh, Director Hines isn't here, but Director Winskill is. And, you know, that was a big step for us to move into that direction. And as we've implemented that, it has helped us to win this very, very prestigious um, award. And it says that, it, from what I've been told, that they rank us and across the country now as one of the top six school districts in the country. And that says a lot for our staff, it says a lot for our community, our teachers. Uh, so this isn't just another grant that we have secured, like many that we do for, for things. This is, as I was told, a big deal for, for Tacoma Public Schools. And I know that we're moving forward. I've been really interested in following where we are. And we, when they were here, they got uh, a dinner that eve together and invited all of our our business leaders in our community were there. Mayor Strickland was there. I was there as board president and also as former mayor. Dr. Pagano was there. And we did a, they let them know that we are 
as, as Tom Pearson from the uh, Chamber of Commerce said, when it comes to Tacoma Public Schools and what we're doing, we are all in. So this is not just a Tacoma Public School effort. This is a community, as you saw our partners uh, across. And I want to thank those partners. I want to you know, thank you. And I'm, I'm looking forward for coming and taking over from Jen, because she was Jen, Jennifer Kabiska, who's now a school superintendant down in, in I'm never going to forgive her. I'm not since she's 10 years old, but that's OK. That's another discussion. <laughs> for, but seriously, we're happy for her. And I'm looking forward to this program uh, becoming a national model for uh, all of the adversity and things that children go through in their lives and how to deal with them and to become productive adults giving back to their community. So it wasn't a question, it's a comment because I have really watched this very, very closely as Carl and, and Josh know and, and through some back channel stuff just to know where we were and what's going on. So. Uh, onward and upward and we'll look forward to the data gathering and where we are and, and, and especially the piloting of the schools. That's what I'm interested in. Could we get a list of what those schools are, who they are, not uh, what they are, sorry, who they are? Absolutely. I will um, share these papers with you and here's a list up on the screen as well. Um, are there any other questions? Super. Director, you want to yeah, I just, um, Over the years as I've gone to the school board convention, I've heard some really good speakers on issues such as this and uh, so since there is a lot of money involved, do we have money to bring speakers in that are, you know, kind of invigorate the staff and give them some ideas? And I mean, is that part of this grant? Uh, we do have the opportunity. We are uh, working on contracts with the fabulous Soretta Hammond mm -hmm. and um, also uh, Keith Matheny at this time, who is a leader in SEL practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to give you a couple names of people I've heard at the school board convention who are very good, so for consideration at least. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Well, thank you for your report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. superintendent has one additional I just wanted uh, as part of my report I just wanted to do a shout out to uh, Northeast Tacoma I was there mm -hmm. last evening for um, a, a celebration that they had and I think it's a, a, a group of uh, a group of citizens that may have gone unnoticed but they work in Northeast elementary schools and they provide uh, backpacks for the for the weekend for students that are in need and have hunger needs. We don't always think of Northeast Tacoma as having uh, um, you know, a population of students that need food, but they do. They, this group of uh, volunteers, they're all volunteer workers, and they provide over 500 backpacks every month uh, to students that need this weekend help. So I just wanted to do a shout out to them. Uh, what, an incre what an incredible uh, mission, and um, they get donations if you feel so inclined send some money up to the either you can uh, provide a donation to any of the PTA presidents at uh, the Northeast Elementary Schools so just wanted to make sure they got some recognition Great. thank you yeah. well we will move on to item number seven members of the public wishing to address the board School board members encourage public participation. Your input is appreciated. If you'd like to address the school board, please follow these steps. First, complete a citizen's request to speak card, which is located at the back of the auditorium. Submit the card to the school board secretary prior to the start of the meeting. Cards submitted after the public comment period has ended will not be considered at this session. The superintendent will call your name when it's your turn to address the school board. Please speak into the microphone. You'll have up to three minutes to share your comments, and you will get a warning. It'll go off when you have one minute left. First speaker is, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Please pronounce your name when you come to the microphone in case I've mispronounced it. I think it's um, Shazia Carter. Shazia? No. <laughs> She's followed by Karen Strickland. Go ahead, say your, say your, say your correct pronunciation. Hi, my name is Shaeja Carter. I am a senior at Mount Tahoma High School who was given the opportunity to participate in the Next Move internship this year. The Next Move internship program is a great, was a great opportunity for me and I really appreciate it. The Next Move internship allowed me to physically intern at a place that I'm interested in as a career. During the semester, I entered at Express Professional 
Express Employment Professionals with the Payroll and Benefit Manager. My experience there was one of the highlights of my senior year. While there, I learned the payroll process, employee wages, sick time, sick time laws, and how to input data and find certain data in multiple databases. Plus, after a couple of weeks of interning there, I got hired, so I was able to make money, which was a, was a bonus because <laughs> senior year is really expensive. <laughs> Second reason why I really enjoyed the Next Move Internship Program was because of the resources given to the students. When we first start the program, we're given a booklet that, uh, that teaches us how to create cover letters, resume, and different papers that we need to be successful for getting a job. So with all that being said, I would like to thank you for funding and supporting the Next Move Internship Program. It really helped me grow professionally and I hope the program continues to be in place to help other juniors and seniors like me. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, Karen Strickland, just, and uh, after Karen is Chuck Meyer. Sorry. Just for clarification, um, um, can you tell us how the timer will work tonight? Yes. I'm having some technical difficulties. I've got it on my phone. Okay, okay. so will they get a one minute warning? Okay, so <laughs> you just have to listen for it, okay. Good evening, my name's Karen Strickland, and I'm actually a product of Manitou Elementary, grade junior high, and Mount Tahoma. So, um, yay, Mount Tahoma. <laughs> um, I've been a member of the American Federation of Teachers Washington for about 25 years, and I currently serve as the president of the state federation. Uh, at the, in the school district here, the Tacoma Federation of Paraeducators, which is affiliated with AFT Washington, represents the paraeducators. And I'm actually here representing, in place of Barb Randall Salee, the president of the local who's out sick tonight. So, um, you know, I've gotten to know the paraeducators over the years in my role as the president. Um, but on Tuesday, I have to say, I got to spend some pretty concentrated time with a number of the paraeducators at one of the schools, really hearing their stories and the struggles that they're facing. I think I heard a lot about the, the challenges, and I also heard a lot about the satisfaction that they get from the work that they do. The things that struck me is these are people who are working with, very often working with, the most vulnerable of the students in the school district. And their role is essential to the success of those students and to the well-being of the students and the families. They play an, a critical role in the schools, and they're so completely dedicated. You know, they're the ones that are making sure that the proper food is provided to the medically fragile student, fra medically fragile students. Uh, they're the ones that are waiting at the waiting for the late bus, uh, regardless of how long that takes, and regardless of whether they're on or off the clock. Their dedication is phenomenal. Um, their heart is with working with the kids and in the schools that they work with. And it was striking to me, I heard a number of stories. For example, one of the stories that I heard was of a paraeducator who spends her day at the school, goes home and goes to sleep until 11 o'clock at night so that she can get up and go work her second job from 11.30 to 3.30 in the morning. She comes back home, takes a short nap for a couple of hours, and then goes back to school at 7.30 in the morning. The reason she, and she's not the only one who has more than one job, the reason she does that is because the pay is, is not adequate. Um, many of these folks work full time, it's not really full time, but they work as much as they're allowed to as a paraeducator, but they can't afford the health care insurance that the school district offers. They don't have enough money to afford that. I'm here today to really urge you to consider seriously the, the meaningful and significant impact that these people, these professionals make to keep the schools running, to keep the kids uh, prepared to learn and supported so that they can get the needs that they have, uh, but that they're, they're not paid adequately, the benefits are not adequate for the work that they're doing, such that, you know, many of them qualify for state assistance in various forms, whether it's working connections, child care, or food assistance or whatever it is, and people shouldn't work full time making this kind of significant contribution to the community and then not be able to afford to raise their families. Thank you. Thank you. Just in the interest of getting um, through every comment, we'd ask that you keep your applause and cheers after each speaker to a minimum, just so that we can move through public comment. Thank you. 
Chuck Meyer is going to be com uh, followed by Jillian Guitares. President Cobb, members of the board, thanks for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Uh, I've been viewing the, the web page of the board, and there's this great little function that says contact the board. So about 10 days ago, I sent an email out with a question, and I haven't got a response yet. And I'm just wondering if there are technical issues going on with that, um, if there is a, a time frame that we can expect you know, answers to questions. It seems, seems to be a really good way to communicate uh, using the email function rather than uh, calling people on the phone. And that was just my comment. I just want to make the comment that I like telephone calls. <laughs> the best way to get Tony, hold me. Will you just go follow up with him and get his name and number so we can make sure. Jillian uh, Guitares, followed by Tom O'Kelly. Hi, my name is Jillian Gutierrez and I am a teacher at Mary Lyon Elementary School. And I'm here to urge you and the district to really consider bargaining well for para compensation. Normally you'd see us here in red arguing for ourselves, but our paras are very important. Uh, in our building alone, um, we have many uh, paras, especially with our self-contained autism program, and those jobs are very difficult. I would encourage every member on the board to come out to our school and spend a day in our self-contained classes and see what these wonderful and dedicated men and women do every single day. And then ask yourself, if after 20 years of dedicated service to the district, if $23,000 is enough, because it's not. After taxes, <clears throat> um, and I've probably missed a few of them, computing during my lunch break today, a para, a P6, which is the highest you can get unless you are a sign language interpreter or a Head Start uh, teacher, will take home around $578.04 if they opt for one of the district's health care plans. And we all need health care today. That's not enough to support a family. That's barely enough to support yourself if you're lucky. That's after 20 years of service. A para with a PA2 and an associate's degree will pull in $13,825.40. You can make more in the city of SeaTac, working for $15 an hour at McDonald's. You receive two more paychecks a year than our paraeducators would, and you're not changing diapers or toileting small children. You're not being spit on, yelled at, or abused. But these men and women come daily because they care about our children. They care about our students. They exemplify our motto, every student, every day. And this is the best that you can do for them. This is what you're telling them that their time and their energy and their effort and their love is worth. I think you can do better. And I would challenge you to seriously consider bringing them up to at least a living wage. Thank you. Tom O'Kelly, followed by Grant Ruby. President Cobb, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, this little artifact here is ancient, 91 years old. Um, it's a catalog of the classes the district used to offer as night classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we seriously should start some of these back up because they are of benefit to not just our students but to the entire community. Um, all of us at every level, teachers, administrators, board, the state, talking about community schools, but nobody seems to have a plan how to bring them back in. I do. This thing lists classes that seem to be endless. Um, there are classes at Lincoln Stadium, which were the only two high schools we had at the time, and at Central. At all three schools, they start off with citizenship classes, beginning, intermediate, advanced English, naturalization classes, to help people to become citizens. We need those. There are 15,035 parents, 15,035 households in our high schools alone where English is not the primary language. We can fix that. If we bring in language classes for our parents, the parents and the students even our ELL classes can do much better 
if they're working together. That's something we need to do for our parents, for our students, for our communities. It's, we can't do this without everybody. Every student every day, our parents should be some of our students also. And we should not look at this merely as an artifact from the past. We should look at it also as a bridge to the future. Because we can't say, oh yeah, we used to do that, but we never do that anymore. And I made eight and a half by 11 copies of this, so I know you guys can read it a little better than this thing. Um, it's fabulous. It's this seemingly endless list of classes. And on the very front of it, it says, for persons from other countries to learn to speak and read English and prepare for citizenship. For workers in shops, offices, and stores to improve themselves through studies related to their daily work. For young women, men and women compelled to leave school before finishing the eighth grade to complete the work of grade school. For those who had no high school courses to, complete high, to take high school courses. For those who wish to add to their scholastic attainments to take studies they missed in high school or college. Isn't that our job? We need to bring these back. Even if we start small with the citizenship and language classes for our adults. This will help bring community schools back into the district. We need those. We need to have them. Our schools should not be blocks of cement taking neighborhoods apart. They need to be community centers where parents, families, even neighbors who are not members of the school district can come in. Who gets this? Thank you. Thank you. Grant, Grant Ruby followed by Sally Perkins. took my breath and now I'm waiting. Hello, I'm Grant Ruby, fourth year math teacher at Lincoln High School and Tacoma Education Association executive board member. With the $382.17 after taxes that I recently received from the Tacoma board, I will be able to buy 25 boxes of fiber one bars for my students who aren't able to eat breakfast or lunch at school. Instead of snacks for my students, I could purchase about 150 composition notebooks for my students to take notes in. Many of my students' families are unable to afford basic supplies, and I often purchase supplies with my own money to ensure that my students have the necessary materials to be successful academics. There are many other things that I could purchase with this money that would help my students because that is where the money is needed. I know that budgets are tight, but we need to do more for our students in classrooms, for teachers in classrooms, and for the wonderful paraeducators in classrooms. Thank you. Sally Perkins. Uh, I'm here to speak about district security and safety. I appreciate the work that TPS staff is doing around district and building security as reported at the May 17th study session. Based on the presentation, I wanted to raise some questions for your consideration. One, what will constitute acceptable ID for a person to be allowed into a school building? Some parents may not have driver's license and undocumented people may not have or want to show an ID. How will this be handled? If a person seeking to two, if a person seeking to enter a school building does not speak English, what is the plan for communicating effectively with that person? About 10% of TPS students are English language learners, which means that their parents likely are too. How will these parents be made to feel welcome at their child's school? Three, the study session presentation emphasized locked doors, cameras, secure buildings, etc. It felt pretty law enforcement focused to me. Those kinds of measures will help some students feel safe. But for other students, particularly for black and brown students and families who often feel over-scrutinized by law enforcement already, this greater security may make them actually feel less safe. How does the district plan to work with the complexity of this issue? Over half of our TPS students are students of color. I note the good work that's being done with Project Peace and the Tacoma Public Schools, and I urge you to use the input from your students to help inform these policies. Four. 
Because implicit, implicit bias is real, whether for skin color or manner of dress or other characteristics, how will the district provide implicit bias training for staff people who control access to buildings? I note that Justina Johnson and her equity team are an excellent in-house resource for this training. I appreciated the part of the study session that sought to link the whole child initiative and social emotional learning to the strengthening of the safety and security culture in school buildings. I think it is really important to integrate the two with a focus on student well-being. What was less clear and what I would urge the district to do is to explain fully how social emotional the learning aspect will be integrated into building policies and procedures for safety and security so that students will indeed feel warmly welcomed as will their parents. Having been the director of Planned Parenthood during the era of clinic arsons, bombings and shootings, I have a first hand awareness of the challenges you face in trying to balance security and a welcoming environment and I appreciate the difficulty and the tension in those two things. I appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas, and I hope they're helpful to you as you move ahead to assure that all students and families feel safe and welcome at your schools. Thank you. That, con that concludes our public comment for tonight, and I wanna thank all those who gave feedback. So with that, we will move on to item number eight, the consent agenda. Um, item 8.0, oh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move approval. No. Second. Any questions about items on the consent agenda tonight? All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Um, Superintendent Santorno? We don't ever get an opportunity to um, usually introduce our assistant principals that are new, but since we have one out in the audience, I thought I should introduce him. Kai Pierce, would you stand up? There's Kai. Let's, he used to be the dean at Truman. He is the new AP at Jadroni Middle School. Thanks for coming, Kai. And I think I saw you moving chairs in the back, too, so thank you for that. <laughs> Item nine, policy matters. There are no policy matters tonight. Item 10, quarterly financial update. 10.1, second quarter 2017-18 financial update. Good evening. I am here to present the second quarter financial update. So all of this data is as of February 28th, which is when second quarter closed. So first up, I have uh, just a projection of what our enrollment looks to be. As you can see, we are down about 44 FTE students from last year. And then uh, versus budget, we're down about 72 FTE. And the majority of that does come from high school. And if, when I was looking at it by grade level, the majority of that um, came from 12th grade. Uh, next up is staffing. So we are up 11 certificated staff from last year and 14 classified staff. And then versus budget, we're down 46 FTE uh, certificated and 85 classified. And as I get into the financials, you'll see that um, a lot of our savings and expenditures for the year do come from salaries and benefits, just from being down the 131 FTE from budget. So here is my current uh, projection of where I think we're gonna end the school year. Uh, so we originally budgeted to begin the school year with 38.7 million in the beginning fund balance and we actually started the year about 4.6 million below that with 34 million in our beginning fund balance. Currently, revenues are projected to be about 414.5 million, which brings total resources to 448.5 million, which is 11.8 um, million under budget for revenues. And the majority of that does come from um, local taxes. Just year to date, we have not seen as much taxes as we thought we were gonna get when we originally created the budget. Looking at the numbers today though, I know I'm speaking to second quarter, I am seeing a bit of an increase April taxes came in um, much closer to what we originally budgeted. So that has changed a little since I initially did this projection. 
Also, we always build in a supplemental capacity of $8.5 million in revenue. And so that's also where that deficit is coming from. For expenditures, I'm currently projecting us to come in about 10.9 million below budget. Like I said, the majority of that comes from salaries and benefits. About 8.5 million between salaries and benefits is where I'm seeing us um, coming and spending under budget. So that brings us to end the year at about 28.1 million in our ending fund balance, which is about 925,000 below what we had budgeted. Uh, this is just a tr uh, five year trend of where we've been with revenues and expenditures. Mm -hmm. As you can see, currently expenditures do outpace revenues, but that is um, obviously a track that's not sustainable and, and is just uh, in happening right now, but it's not going to keep continuing. So one of the things that we look at to kind of gauge our, we call it our financial health indicator, and um, OSPI kind of grades all the school districts on these things. Ending fund balance is one of them. Another thing is our um, monthly cash balance. So this is just a chart that shows where we project to end the year, and then also you can see monthly cash balances by month. Um, and so as you can see, we're projecting we'll end the school year with 41.9 million in cash balance, which is uh, pretty close to how we ended 16-17 uh, uh, school year. So another thing that this equates to is basically, uh, it's a formula where you take uh, cash on hand and you divide it by daily average expenditures and then that's how you can see how many days of cash on hand we have. So it basically means if we were to run out of resources, how many days could we sustain uh, the school district? So right now we're projecting we'll end the school year at about 38.93 school days and uh, OSPI <laughs> to meet their A plus financial indicator would like to see that at 90, which is just not a reasonable number. So we as a district try to stay within 40 to 50 days is what we're aiming for. So we're right at that. And like I said, with the most current numbers, the taxes, I'm seeing it closer to 40 days. And then this last slide just shows the different buckets that we put that ending fund balance in versus restricted, committed, um, and just the general fund operating expenses. That is all I have. Any Anyone questions? Has any questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah I do too. Um, Director Winskill. Can go Winskill? Yeah, I'd just like to ask, uh, when we look at cash on hand, where are we in the pecking order uh, with other districts of like size? So I compared us to the top 10 school districts by enrollment, and we're pretty much smack dab in the middle between some of them. Uh, the highest, I believe, was 77 days, and the lowest was 13. Thank you. That's Thank all you. I have. Director Vial? <laughs> um, I'd like you to really differentiate between cash balance and reserves because people think we're going to watch out there and think we have an extra $41 million yeah. and that's not the case. That's the money we have on hand to pay our bills. Exactly. Correct? Yes. yes that is that. what we use right. to pay it's our bills, we, payroll, benefits, all that. That is so what we use for we got for about that. enough for about three payrolls, I yes, think. Yes, exactly. I look. That's the perfect way to okay. put it. Yes. So it's just money like in our, our checking account before we pay our bills. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to ask you about where the reserves are at this point, what the percentage and where are we? Because I know we were, those were coming down yes. um, pretty so, pretty rapidly. Yeah, so as you know, the requirement by the school board policy is 5%, and we're currently at 6.81%. Okay, so we picked up a little. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that just simply equates to um, not a heck of a lot of money co compared to a 400 and what eight million dollar budget yes so i know some people think that is a surplus it's not it's a rainy day savings account yeah. is the way to look at it and we don't want that to go below five percent in case we have some catastrophic issues that we need to deal with and that's a pretty common number across most governmental agencies the city uses five um, the state tries to stay at that level and in their rainy day reserve funds and so i just want to clarify some terms because sometimes you know this is pretty technical stuff and if you've not worked with it it's real easy to say oh my goodness the city you know the the school district has 41 million dollars in the bank and 
no we do not have 41 yeah. million dollars in the bank so correct so thank you um as we move forward on on the um revenue projections uh do you see them staying pretty stable so I just finished April today, and it was, I believe, at like 14, 4, 14.5. So on here I had uh, 4.13. So it's a slight increase, but they're, they're tracking pretty steady. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Director wants yeah, to go? Yeah, I had one other question about, um, you know, the drop in um, enrollment for high school. Mm -hmm. um, is that typical? to see that I know in the past we've seen drops second semester constantly um, are we going to reflect that in the budget I mean is it common uh, have we seen this in previous years and would we reflect that in the budget going forward yes okay. so when we get apportionment I also project that out and so it's also reflected in my um, budget projection as well yes Okay. And it is pretty common, and the um, the variance in the high school is mostly against budget, not versus last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, thanks. All right. Thank you for your report. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one, Superintendent one more Santana. thing. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, I think that uh, you talked about the fund balance and mm -hmm. who that is, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, related to Director Vial's question is, if you take those same top ten districts, can you mm -hmm. tell us where we are? With uh, fund balance, uh, fund balance in our account. Unfortunately, I couldn't, don't have that answer for you right now, okay. but I definitely can get back to you with those numbers for okay. sure. It's definitely yeah. lower. Than, it's you know, it's under the um, fifty percent level. We're, I mean, we are in the lower half right. of districts with well, fund balance. Friday report we got about two weeks ago did that yeah. for us, okay. and it did show us. Kristen, you want to answer? It did show us say, among. Okay. We're second lowest. Yeah, we're second lowest right now. Oh, okay. Can't. Who is Kent in is very first, serious financial lowest, difficulties? Is, we're yeah, next. Right, is the only one. So I, I should have said that. That, that you. you know, having been in that business for a long back when the state had serious issues, it's really starting to scare me a little bit, frankly, that it has gone. We're we're riding at that at that level, and hopefully we'll figure. It, hopefully we'll get a change in the law next year and be able to collect the full value of our levy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Scared. We will move on now to item number 11, con curriculum and instruction. There are no con curriculum and instruction matters tonight. Item 12, business matters. 12.1, approval of grant proposal to the Wallace Foundation's Partnerships for Social and Emotional Learning Initiative. The Deputy Superintendent recommends the Board of Directors approve this request for funding for the Wallace Foundation in the amount not to exceed $3 million for the period of two, September 1st, 2018 through August 31st, 2019. And if funded, approve expenditure for funds according to accepted guidelines. And funding source. Oh. oh, nope. Keep going. <laughs> funding source, the Wallace Foundation. I just want to add one little uh, comment. Not all of this would come to the Tacoma Public Schools. It's, uh, it's part of the citywide partnership oh. grant. Thank okay. you. I move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Are there questions about this yeah. item, um, Director Winskill? Okay, so um, I did have questions that I thought were more appropriate to waiting until we were voting on it than before. Um, uh, how many staff mem uh, p people do you think we will um, hire with this grant, or is it going to work within existing staff? This uh, right now, I believe we have three staff members that are. Uh, funded out of the grant specifically uh, in the Tacoma Public Schools. I don't believe we have, come on up, Laura. Um, I'm not sure that uh, when we look at next year, we won't, there won't be a dramatic increase of that. They're very um, hesitant it's about really funding staff as much as professional development and orchestration. Okay, so that's what I wanted to know, exactly how this money was being spent, so. I believe it's 3.75. Thank you. Okay. I can read the 0. 0.75 out of the uh -huh. fingers. But, <laughs> it's yeah. giving the 0. 0.75 yeah. fingers. And then um, I had another question. Uh, it's out of my brain. Darn it. Um, mm. now oh, yeah, directs. I see what we could take no directs. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of unusual for a grant. Well, it's a community-wide partnership, mm -hmm. and so part of our efforts was, since this was building on the Tacoma Whole Child Initiative, was to find community partners that were also invested in the development of shift two. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, when we talked about indirects, um, we would really be taking indirects from resources that would be going to our community partners. And then um, some of our community partners agencies would also want to collect indirects at a much higher rate than we traditionally do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we made an agreement with them that we would not be collecting indirects, but put all of the money into the, the grant itself. Okay, and then we do, do we have to do periodic reports? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to do annual reports to the Wallace Grant, and um, it's, it's a dynamic year-to-year -year process as far as grant funding goes, based on the needs and how far they have uh, perceived we have come to meet our uh, established goals, as well as um, any potential areas that we may want to expand. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Dire oh, Director Vial, do you, did you have No, just reiterate what I said before, this isn't your normal grant, and Wallace wants the money not to be spent on staff using our own, but for the professional development, for the teaching, and with the community partners, and I think that's helped us immensely in that we accepted that and said we're gonna move forward with it, so money's gonna go where it's needed, not to for indirects and to go other places, so just that comment. I just have one comment about the grant, too. I, I'm really excited about this work, mm -hmm. especially with the RAND Corporation being involved and mm -hmm. their um, uh, sophisticated sort of research and evaluation capacity. I actually was reading an uh, evaluation that Rand wrote today for the Wallace Foundation on out-of-school time, and they made reference to um, a large initiative that the Wallace Foundation had funded, that f more findings will be coming out soon. So I just think that this is a real great opportunity for the work that's happening in Tacoma and among the other five school districts to inform nationally, um, telling the story about the value of out-of-school time mm -hmm. partnerships and embedding social emotional learning and social teaching, explicit teaching of social emotional competencies in core instruction. And I just think this is a great opportunity for Tacoma to be help informing the work nationally. So I look forward to the findings to come. All those in favor, it's been moved and seconded, right? All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, the motion is adopted. Okay. Item 13.1, other business. Um, or item 13 and then 13.1, approval of contract extension TSD 14079, district annual fuel via addendum number one. The chief financial officer recommends that the board of directors authorize the superintendent to finalize and sign addendum number one for a two extension of the contract with Associated Petroleum Products. Incorporated for the district's annual fuel services for the period of September 1st, 2018 through August 31st, 2020. Move, Move adoption. Second it. Any questions or comments? Very exciting. <laughs> the savings. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Exciting when the motion's adopted. Right. <laughs> Item 13.2, approval of contract for district furniture, fixtures, and equipment. The Deputy Superintendent, on behalf of the Chief Operating Officer, recommends that the Board of Directors approve the Superintendent uh, approve the Superintendent to negotiate and award a contract for securing the purchase of furniture, fixtures, and equipment from Catalyst as needed. I'll, I'll second. I'll second. I approve the, the I'll motion. I'll move it. You can second it. I move adoption. I'll second it. Thank it's been you. Moved and seconded. Are there questions about Just item thirteen point two? Just or comments. If I might, just for 13.2 and 13.3, and, and I can channel Director Heinz, we do that so well, having worked together, that uh, changing the way that we've done this is saving a significant amount of money, and I want to commend again Chris Williams because we had just not bid it, and now we are doing it, and we're doing multiple bids and getting much better results. So anyway, uh, good move on our part and much better business practices. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of adopting 13.2 signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. I want to put in a word for Truman who said that their furniture is getting old and rickety <laughs> <laughs> when I was out there visiting. Item 13.3, approval of contract for district furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Gordon. The deputy superintendent on behalf of the chief operating mm -hmm. officer recommends that the board of directors approve the superintendent to negotiate and award a contract for securing the purchase of furniture, fixtures, and equipment from Gordon Products as needed. I move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. 
Item 13.4, approval of Washington Interscholastic, Interscholastic Activities Association membership renewal and school board resolution. Move adoption. Second it. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments about this item? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Item 13.5, approval of the Maxim Healthcare contract for 1819 nursing services. The Deputy Superintendent on behalf of the Assistant Superintendent of Student Support Services recommends that the Board of Directors approve the attached contract for service with Maxim Healthcare Services for nursing services for the 2018-19 school year and authorize the superintendent to engage in any final negotiation of terms related to the same as necessary. Move approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or comments about this item? Just one comment. This is just the annual renewal of this contract, so if people know this is something we've done for a long time. We have, you know, have to do this because we don't have enough school nurses, and this is a provides us backup when we need it. And you may want. To, we have um, uh, shortage. Yeah. So people in our district, so we go out and contract. So and various, not just nursing, but other other things other too. You know, healthcare. Uh, psychiatric services, things like that. So we've had this contract since I've been on the board. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is adopted. Item 13.6, approval of interlocal agreement between Tacoma Schools and Children's Administration. The Deputy Superintendent on behalf of the Assistant Superintendent of Student Support Services recommends that the Board of Directors approve the interlocal agreement between Children's Administration and the Tacoma School District. Funding Move source non applicable. <laughs> Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there questions? I have a, is this a new agreement? Yes, no. it is. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a renewal. I apologize, it is. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not the Children's Museum. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's the Assistant Superintendent Troffler? Yes. I know this was. Yeah. It's a new agreement. Yes, fabulous question. Is It is a new one, and it is part of the um, ESSA with the new position of the foster care liaison. And um, as a point of reference, we presently have 312 students that are foster care students in our system. So this just formalizes the communication between the district and Children's Association Administration. In this agreement, is there a priority given in the communication around decisions for students given to their educational stability? Does the agreement speak to how educational decisions are made? For yes, it specifically, it specifically speaks to the flow of the communication and the urgency of to not delay the registration and the services for students. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Thank you. If I could just make a quick pitch for anyone that is at home or in the crowd, uh, there is a shortage of foster care mm -hmm. homes available in Tacoma. And mm -hmm. so uh, yep. if anyone ever has an interest in exploring that, they can reach out to the superintendent's office and we can connect them with the right agencies that are looking at that. But it's becoming a more and more of a crisis situation for stable housing for foster mm -hmm. care students and our desire would be is to keep them in our own community. Yeah, thank you for making mm -hmm. that point. So anyone who has a warm, safe, nurturing home, please reach out. Item 13.6, approval of interlocal agreement. Oh wait, that's what we... 13.7. 13.7, excuse me. Item 13.7, approval of three-year commitment agreement between Tacoma Schools and Edgenuity, Inc. The Deputy Superintendent, on the behalf of the Assistant Superintendent of Student Support Services, recommends that the Board of Directors approve the interlocal agreement between Edgenuity, Inc. and the Tacoma School District Funding Source Title I LAP. I move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions about this item? Could you explain to me what Edgenuity, Inc. is? You bet. Edgenuity is a company that does online uh, learning. Um, and it's, so it's an online catalog of classes that are available for students to access. Um, it is, uh, I'd say probably realistically, five to 10 years ago, anything that was done uh, would have been like considered credit retrieval. But students in Edgenuity can take classes to challenge themselves. 
And it's really unique in the situation that um, our students with your policy can challenge up out of classes, um, but they can also, um, they have a pre-assessment where they take and then the, the curriculum is designed around the gaps that they are missing. Um, students can take additional classes at no cost, um, so we offer a seats. And th the way it works is we can have multiple students registered as long as um, to a certain seat limit, um, as long as they're not all taking classes at the exact same moment. And what I mean by that is, is at 6.50 at night. They can all be registered and they can work through that. And so the number of seats is really multiplied if opportunity and wants uh, for students to take. Especially good for summer school too. Mm -hmm. It's we've used that, in, and we also provide uh, in our summer school programming uh, additional classroom teachers to provide additional support. So it's not just like, hey, go take it online, and if there's no, you can't work, it doesn't work for you. You're left alone. So we have designated staff as well as teaching support to say, hey, I was trying this, it didn't work. Help me understand this, and so it's we've used it more as a blended learning approach. So we've, we've, how long have we had it? For how many years now? This company. Three years, I believe. And we do evaluations, review that it's mm -hmm. positive, it's working well. And, and I was going to comment on that because Director Hines and I did not care for what we had, and neither did uh, on our online learning. We went out and got ingenuity, and it's made a big difference in the number of kids. And I've seen it. Uh, Director um, Doug Hostetter was the responsible for getting that. I've watched it at FOSS. Kids are on the computers, teachers are helping them. They're in and they're out, and you need to get this done. And it's, as Debbie said, it's helped for enrichment for summer school, and it's also helped some of our kids. It's been a big boost to helping us get the graduation rate up for kids who have been credit deficient come in. It is a blended learning, and Ingenuity seems, has worked much better than what we had uh, before, oh. much, much better. And I think, um, you know, I think our principals and people that use it, and the kids will tell you it was better than what we had before. Yeah. So it's good. It's so there's good. a periodic review of other companies at certain mm -hmm. intervals to confirm that there isn't a better product, I guess would be my follow-up question for that. Yeah, How's so they go done? through an RFP mm -hmm. process after they reach a certain threshold. And we measure success, and you'll get a, a, a mm -hmm. after every summer school um, period, uh, the staff will come to the board and give you an update. And the way we're measuring this is, is um, credits earned. Um, so we're looking at not just how many students are taking it, but how many students are being successful in it. Okay. It's also an approved online program through OSPI, who has a series of online programs that they approve for use in schools. So they vet it as well. Okay. All those in, oh, any additional questions? Mm -mm. All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. And if I can make another picture for anybody that's at home and their student wants to take additional classes, they're welcome to access Ingenuity. They do not have to just be a high school student to access programming in Ingenuity. So we do have sometimes middle school students that want to take high school level classes. Uh, and it is not just for remediation or credit retrieval. So if your student's at home and they want to explore a different class, have them contact their principal. If that's not successful, they can reach out to the K-12 office and we will help make sure that they're successful in registering. I think I asked this question the last year when we had this item on the agenda in the context of middle school students who are challenging themselves mm -hmm. in taking <laughs> high school courses. Um, do they have some flexibility in whether or not that grade, if they're not as successful as they want it to be, whether or not that grade shows up on their high school transcript? Yes, it's a great question. Um, so really um, what is critical is, is the family makes the decision of we provide some guidance especially around math not especially uh, in math uh, because all, all of our students are in algebra about what determination should a family consider before applying that credit to their high school transcript um, if you're getting an a in the class uh, that's a great obviously it's going to help your gpa a b is something to strongly consider if you're getting below a B, um, you may want to consider what is the impacts of that of your GPA. But ultimately, it's the family's decision, and they notify the school whether or not they want the credit. Okay, thank you. Um, we approved that, right? I'm losing track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item number 14: report to the board, curriculum and instruction adoption update. Good evening, President Cobb, members of the board. As part of our multi-year commitment to update our alignment with Washington State Learning Standards, the Curriculum and Instruction Department has identified a process of vetting existing instructional materials using a scoring tool. 
If existing instructional materials are identified as out of date and budget allows, the curriculum instruction department then moves forward in working through the adoption of updated instructional materials. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to update you about the process of adopting instructional materials that teams of Tacoma Public School educators have been working through this school year in alignment with your board policies. I'm going to start this presentation by providing you an overview of the adoption process and a snapshot of the content areas being considered for updated instructional materials and then provide you with an overview of where we are in the process for sexual health education instructional materials. Per your board policy and regulation 2020 and 2020 R, there are two levels of committees involved in adopting instructional materials. The overarching committee, the, the overarching diverse group is the instructional materials committee or what we call the IMC. Then for each content area that is considering adoption, of uh, adopting updated materials, a district <coughs> curriculum development committee, or what we refer to fondly as the DCDC, is brought together. I'm going to briefly share about the role of the IMC and the DCDC, then give you an update about instructional materials that have been <coughs> under review this school year. The curriculum and instruction department convened the IMC to overview the process for selecting and recommending the adoption of instructional materials. They have met in November, January, and April of this school year. They have dates on the calendar to meet four times during the 18-19 school year as well to align with your board regulation expectations for members to serve on the committee for two years. Our superintendent acted upon the clause in Regulation 2020 that allows up to two parent members to be included in the Instructional Materials Committee. We appreciate the support from other departments to help us identify and recruit parents for this committee. Each time the IMC meets, they follow the expectations outlined in your policy 2020 to review proposed DCDC lists for upcoming adoptions of non-instructional materials. The IMC members have ex exercised their right to nominate additional members to the DCDC thanks to their diverse perspectives. The IMC also reviews and provides feedback on the scoring criterion for vetting the curriculum. This visual provides a high level overview of each phase during this adoption process in alignment with the local expectations from your board regulations as well as our purchasing department. Phase one, the D DCDC submits lists of vendors and scoring criteria to the IMC. Phase two, we partner with purchasing for options and then we score the materials. Phase three, which is optional for the district, we oftentimes will then want to pilot materials of the top vendors to determine their effectiveness before we move to a recommendation for adoption. Phase four, the IMC final evaluation is made and then we provide a recommendation to the superintendent to move forward for adoption. And phase five, the superintendent would then recommend to you, the school board, to adopt the given curriculum. This table provides a brief overview of the content areas for which we have been reviewing instructional materials for consideration of adoption this year. The right hand column indicates the current phase in which the content area is progressing through. We anticipate that we will have two board items with requests to approve curriculum adoptions for sexual health curriculum and two of our world language contents in late June, so just a few weeks away. For your reference, on the right side of this slide and other slides, you will find links to related board policies and regulations, as well as to the OSPI websites and reg in related laws, including a link to policy 2125 on health, family life, and sexual education, which states instruction will take place as appropriate to the grade level and course of study. 
The policy also specifies that families will have the opportunity to review any sexual health curriculum and may exercise the right to request that their student be excluded from sexual health education and human sexuality courses. In the fall of 2018, the Curriculum and Instruction Department solicited input from principals about current approaches and needs for the support in regard to sexual health and education in grades K, or excuse me, fifth through 12th grade. The data from principals showed a need for updated curriculum and supports for communicating with families. As a result of this need, the Curriculum and Instruction Department began the process of identifying updated materials as a starting place. In alignment with these local and state expectations, we've been working with the DCDC to review instructional materials for annual se sexual education in grades 5th through 12th grade. The Curriculum and Instruction Department began with OSPI's list of approved vendors as they are in alignment with Washington state laws and learning standards. In addition to having traditional members of the DCDC, as defined by your board policy 2020, the Curriculum and Instruction Department collaborated with our Family and Community Partnership Office to invite leaders representing 12 local community organizations and our families. Community members who were not officially part of the DCDC provided valuable feedback on each of the vendors uh, and about rollout considerations, such as highly important topics for students to learn, considerations for communicating with a variety of stakeholders, and thoughts about the professional development supports that we should provide our staff. The IMC is currently reviewing the process that the Curriculum Instruction Department went through, along with our district's top rated vendors. In the event, the recommend, recommended materials for this content continue through the next phases of adoption, then the Curriculum and Instruction Department will develop a plan to bring a committee of Tacoma Public School educators, families, and community members to inform the rollout of this curriculum. We are in contact with OSPI and other school districts to learn about the approaches that they have taken as they've rolled out similar curriculum. We are committed to providing family information nights from a district level throughout our regions, as well as direct support to schools with integrating family information nights about the sexual health curriculum instructional materials on their campuses and within their local communities. The important voices on this committee will be integral to forming, informing our efforts. We look forward to bringing you more updates at the next board meeting about other content areas that we are moving forward or moving through the adoption of materials process as well as in Friday reports. Our next board meeting you will hear about the work we're doing on science and where we are in the phase of adoption as well as world languages. What questions can I answer for you? Thank you. Um, Director Winsco? Yes. Um, you actually did a really comprehensive um, Mm -hmm. uh, report on what was coming up because a lot of those were my questions. So this has been controversial, this uh, development of this curriculum, especially for elementary. So you're talking about five through 12. Is it going to go below uh, those grades? At this point in time, we are not looking below those grades right now, but we will continue to provide you with information as we get more information about where we are with grades K through four. Great. and. Um, so I would like, when I see the material, I'd like to have the material to review for a couple weeks, not like two days before the meeting. So if we could have, I don't know if other people feel the same way, but I personally would like to review the material. And um, I like the fact that you brought up the parent uh, part that um, they can take their children out of the program if they want, because that is um, something I know that's uh, important to a lot of people. But uh, anyway, I would like that material. Great, we can in do advance. that. And that is stipulated in your BARD policy mm -hmm. 2125 that all parents can opt out using a form mm -hmm. and will be provided alternative appropriate instruction during that time. Great, thank, thank you. you. Director Vial. I have a question, Marie, uh, about when the, you're going now for the, you know, with the curriculum alignment, how does your vertical alignment process fit into the selection of new curriculum? The vertical and, and alignment, know, such as with the priority standards and all the work that we've been doing, that's a great question. And we, so 
part of our work is to prioritize those standards, which you've heard about in other reports and through your and your, through your Friday reports. In addition to that, then, we spend time vetting our current materials for whichever grade levels that we're speaking about. So if it's kindergarten through fifth, kindergarten through eighth, kindergarten through twelfth, we go through a rigorous process of vetting those materials against the standards. And that is done with the teachers, with teams of educators. So, so we bring them together, they vet the materials, and then using a rubric we determine, so are the materials currently meeting the needs the high rigor needs of these standards. If we determine that they're not, that they perhaps are outdated, then that's when we move forward funding depending, as I said earlier, on looking at possible adoption of new so, materials. So the vertical standards are your paradigm, which are gonna Correct. bounce off the, anything that comes down, because so, for some of you that don't know that vertical standards alignment process is a, amazing where we had teams of I, 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 there's a joke I said, Marie thought I might be interested because I actually did some of this work at the state about lining standards up, did it with the state budget, it was a mess, but we, it worked. That all teacher, teachers, have, for example, the math one is the one that I watch, and also the language where the t uh, English language teachers come together from kindergarten through high school and work aligning the standards so that when you start in kindergarten, and you wind up at the 12th grade level, everything should feed up to that level. So it's been an amazing process through every one of our curriculum areas. So I wanted to all that work to be able to understand that that is the baseline and the yes. paradigm through which we are going to be selecting curriculum. Is that correct? Exactly. That is where it starts. You couldn't, I couldn't have stated it as well as you did. That was well, beautifully stated. Well, I'm sure you could do it better, but So yes, you. it's kindergarten through 12th grade, and then the other piece is you go from 12th grade back down to kindergarten. Right. So that vertical both goes ways. both ways yeah. mm -hmm. to ensure that we're provide, preparing students for the next level of learning or the next courses and making certain that those standards that we are identifying as our priorities, we also know that the supporting standards, the other standards are important too, but how do they nest in with the priority standards? Because we know uh, we can't increase the number of hours in the day that our children are here. That's one of our challenges with a sexual education health curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that we're currently looking at that you'll learn more about is a pretty hefty binder. And we just look at that binder and think, oh my goodness, to teach everything in that binder to the same level and depth, we would have to push aside other curriculum or other content areas, which we know is not possible. So once we have the adoption and we've been reached approval, if that does indeed happen, then as I stated, we'll be putting together teams of educators to look at the standards, identify scope and sequences, identify pacing guides and calendars to help schools and pare it down so that we are teaching the most essential pieces and also in accordance with the law. I think for me, the, the watching the vertical alignment process was it was teacher driven. Correct. And I think in the past, it, a lot of the curriculum adoption has been top down. And I see your process being bottom up in right. terms of, uh, because I know uh, when I was doing subbing, expressions came mm -hmm. in and there wasn't I mean, there, that hadn't occurred, and I know that was a very difficult curriculum to mm -hmm. teach and didn't necessarily go where, where we wanted it, wanted it to go. And mm -hmm. having a math background, I was looking at that thinking, wow. So I think uh, for me, that with our teachers and having that input and that ability to say, look, this works, this doesn't work, and with your committee and parent and stuff, I, I really feel good about the curriculum adoptions that we're going to be coming forward with. Thank so you. thank you. We've, we've involved and engaged over 300 educators this year. Last year there were equally as many. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that our teachers, our teacher force, our educators are the experts in this work. They know it, they live it, they teach it every day. We believe their voice is essential and the most important in this work, as well as our families and our community. We have, we have every ounce of faith and we praise and appreciate the work of our educators and we, we listen to them. You know, a couple of times I've had people come to me and say, we come to these meetings, is this, is this really, do you really want to hear our voice? 
and and they sometimes wonder if we've already made a decision before they get to us and we always let them know emphatically that no no decisions have been made you're here to help us with that your voice is essential to this work so i do want to recognize the two directors sitting behind me because i am just the voice here tonight sharing this presentation with you director angie neville and director hannah benro have been leading this work in the curriculum and instruction department i will tell you that they are lifting some heavy heavy loads working late into the night but making sure that your board policies are followed to the T and making sure that the voices of this community our educators and students are listened and heard so that we make the best decisions thank you Thanks. thank you any other comments director Leon you mentioned that parents can opt out so if they are um, two parents and they disagree what happens <laughs> That becomes a legal issue. Uh, Thank you. We end up looking at the parenting plan if those parents are uh, not married to see who has the rights to make educational decision making. If they are married, then we have to send them out to try and resolve that and come back with a unified voice. And the uh, this curriculum comes from an outside educational vendor, is or is it made? By Tacoma Public Schools. It does come from an outside educational vendor, and it is a curriculum that you'll hear more about that is widely used across Washington State. And as a matter of fact, it is used widely in Tacoma Public Schools. It's just not adopted. So it is currently being used as a supplemental curriculum in many of our schools and classrooms because we don't have an adopted curriculum currently for sexual health education. And so it is a curriculum that is um, well known, widely used, has been vetted over and over and over again, and it is probably one of the most commonly used across our state. We were not interested in just moving forward and selecting one because we've heard it's the best. We went through the entire curriculum adoption process to and spent many, many weeks on it to ensure that it meets the needs of Tacoma students because we know our students are special and unique, and we want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do for our <coughs> students, not just adopting something or accepting something from another. Other district and currently it's longitudinal from fifth to twelfth grade or that's the future it's it is currently it, it longitudinal is from fifth okay. to twelfth grade Thanks. yes I just have one question about process I appreciate your comments about the team working really hard to make sure that we're um, doing this in accordance with the board policy and that the board policy was adopted like three months before I got here so <laughs> I didn't have the context for that process but looking through the policy there's some really good points in here about what we consider in the screening process so my question is about what kind of support all of our educators who are engaging in this process get in order to um, screen mm -hmm. in a way that's consistent mm -hmm. between kind of raters like what kind of right. training and support do they get especially from my um, from my interest with regard mm -hmm. to the pieces about supporting equitable access to learning and learning materials for mm -hmm. all students um, and then supporting the elimination of bias pertaining to sex mm -hmm. race creed religion all of those mm -hmm. things and in particular the Washington models for evaluation of bias mm -hmm. content how do we help mm -hmm. make sure that educators are all kind of leveled at, or have some common mm -hmm. training around what mm -hmm. these terms and things right. mean and how we are mm -hmm. evaluating in in the screening process what does that look like how's so it actually implemented we call that inner rater reliability mm -hmm. and so prior to embarking upon a rating session with these various curriculum we go through some professional development we have a rubric that we use that's been provided to us by OSPI that is that provides those very types of things to be looking for so there's conversation prior to that actually happening conversations amongst teachers mm -hmm. um, our directors behind me provide that professional learning to our staff prior to them going into the actual rating process Okay. So just to get everyone kind of on the same page, we also work very closely with um, Justina Johnson's department, um, Academic Access and Equity and Access, to have, we have members of that team on our, on our committees um, to, that is one of our greatest um, requirements when we look at these materials is equity across, across all lenses so that is um, certainly at the top of our list in terms of making certain what we adopt is meeting the needs of every student in Tacoma Public Schools. Okay, thank you. And I heard you say too that folks are asked to be on the committees for two years, so that I imagine that that helps with kind of building capacity around right. the process. 
consistency, continuity. We're not having to retrain everyone up like I just mentioned the mm -hmm. training. Uh, it does take time to get people up to speed to understand what is expected. So and we love it when our members will stay for two years per your board policy. <coughs> You're the ones that brilliantly wrote that in here. Um, <laughs> but we believe it's so essential Then we're not starting over. And next year we're looking at um, additional adoptions and so we will be able to hit the ground running without starting up again and we haven't adopted curriculum in Tacoma mm -hmm. Public Schools for a while so it's been very important to me and to Deputy um, Superintendent Garcia that we are being very transparent <coughs> in our process and communicating widely and clearly what this means and what it looks like so that nobody's wondering so what does this look like what's adoption and so we've been providing district to school reports for our principals we've asked our committee members to go out and talk to their colleagues about the work that they're doing and um, we've been providing Friday reports for you all so that you've been apprised along the way so that it's very transparent and clear that we're uh, following the steps that you've given us to follow. So. And I know you said that um, uh, you partnered with the partnership office and mm -hmm. others to bring parents into mm -hmm. this, so I assume that they got some support for engaging in this process too. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And we've invited several community members, mm -hmm. which we can provide for that for you in our Friday report, um, which exactly those community members were and which it were able to attend. We believe that's essential to, uh, because folks hear about this, like Director Winskill said, they're reading about it, they're wondering about it, what does it mean for our students? And so their voice is essential and important to this process as well. Okay. If, Director, if, I, if yeah. I could comment, we were very, very deliberate in the adoption of that policy and we worked very hard as a board to make sure that it came out the way that it did find out and we were uh, we worked with uh, Jen Kabiska and Marie and a whole you know the whole group and making sure that we had we were sensitive to the community needs to the health needs and per and to the equitable needs of our of our community which we I think have been uh, in our policy development in the time that I have been on this board now, which is almost seven years, uh, that being, you know, our core value of equity. And I felt very, I think we, those of us who were here felt very good, and now we're going to see the, the, uh, the implementation of that, and I think we're going to see it, you know, done very professionally and very well, because I think that was our concern, as it is a sensitive issue, and we do uh, have covered, I know that we did have a, people that I know that participated from all across the community said, you know, this is the way we should really do things. And I think that's a good model for us as we move forward. So uh, it's nice when you adopt a policy to see it actually enacted and not just get stuck in a book and nobody pay attention to it. And I want to commend Hannah and, um, who, who am I forgetting? Angie. You? Excuse me? Angie. Angie, Director sorry, I've known Neville. Hannah longer <laughs> uh, for uh, their work in making sure as we go through this process that the board's policies that have been adopted, whether they be our academic acceleration or this policy, making sure that what you are doing is in line with what we as a board have asked uh, the superintendent to make sure happens. And Carla, you and Josh, thank you for following through and sure. making that process work. Okay. I just wanted to mention one other thing. While curriculum adoption typically happens within the curriculum and instruction department, as you heard tonight in an earlier report about the Wallace grant, they're looking at curriculum that mm -hmm. the department is looking at some social emotional learning curriculum. And I just wanted you to know that Director Allen and Director Neville and Director Benro work very closely together to ensure that the processes that we follow in any department in this district are following your policy. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your report. So with that, we will move on to item 15, board comments or reports. And I will start with Director Vial. Thank you. I just, I just yesterday, uh, Director Winskill and I attended the Citizens Audit and uh, Finance Committee where the board reps there. And I'm glad that um, I have a soccer. I want to make a comment and a kudo to our Steve DeMel, who is always our our procurement person in purchasing. And Steve gave a report on uh, sole bids about how we do that and about how that has not served us particularly well in the district. And 
One thing he mentioned is that we have a $40,000 threshold. Anything under $40,000, we don't have to go get bids. Well, he has changed that culture so that particularly in the operations and maintenance division, to have them make calls. And for example, if a water heater goes out, obviously hot water, that's gonna be under 40,000, way under. But to make some, get at least some three bids about call some of our local vendors, which we're trying to get more. And we're saving money because we're finding out that you know, some of the big box stores are not as cheap as we thought they were in our local vendors. So that, just an example of some of the things that our staff does on a daily basis, save money so that we have more money to use on where it should be in the classroom. And just looking at, how, for example, the his work also went over into the, with uh, Steve Williams, or Steve, um, Chris Williams and his staff about looking at, for example, the furniture thing. Going away from sole bidding becomes kind of a, as we talk about it, kind of a, a group and you get a club and people become friends and it's probably not the most productive way to do business. So once again, Steve Genius got spilled over and he came to uh, Paul Walker, asked him to come to finance and um, audit yesterday. So that was very helpful. The other thing that happened is uh, we are getting a clean audit from the state auditor's office uh, once again. And we got kudos for our finance and management. Our Title I office is getting a clean audit. There are 12 schools that they looked at. Six of the school districts, or 12 school districts they looked at. And of the 12 school districts, six are getting major findings and others are getting management letters and we are not. So that is part of the A133 audit, which is a federal audit that must be done. And Title I is a very uh, intricate grant that is given to us finance so um, when you see uh, Tracy Ferguson tell her job well done with her with her staff so this is my day to give kudos and also to Rosalind and to um, Krista and all the all the budget and um, accounting staff I think since I've been here we've had we had one finding and that had to goes back to was kind of a ticky thing having to do uh, with um, some uh, free and reduced lunch things that were not filled out correctly. And I think you weren't, you A probably, number of meatballs, if I recall. Oh, the what? A <laughs> number of meatballs. On yeah, the <laughs> number of meatballs. I mean, they were kind of ticky and we're not getting those. I mean, uh, you know, from, and I, I've done consulting work for the state auditor's office and I talked to Brian at Bont Sontag and I said, that was kind of ticky. And he looked and he said, yeah, it probably was. So in other words, we've not had any major findings in a very long time in this school district. And I think, you know, that in itself, when you're the biggest organization as we are with a $408 million budget and almost 8,000 total employees and 30,000 kids and all kinds of, you know, 60 building sites that I think our unsung heroes around here are an awful lot of our support staff. So I just want to say thank you for the great work you guys all do. And the Audit and Finance Committee just sits there and said, we would be surprised if we had any. So also Paul Walker, one of the things that Carla Santorno did when she became superintendent was to hire an internal auditor. And not re and Paul does not report to her, he reports to the Citizen and Audit Committee and independent. And one of the things that Paul has been able to do is to um, look at things internally before they become problems and, and get them solved and so that we have these clean audits, a lot of responsible for that. So. I think a lot of the board and a lot of the public doesn't realize just how hard we really work to make sure that all of our money is appropriately spent and goes to where it needs to go. So thank you. Dr. Wanskill? Uh, so I don't think we had a meeting since we had the Indian Education mm -mm, dinner. So uh, yeah, Director yeah. Boyal and I and the superintendent were there. Mm -hmm. um, Forty some students uh, um, graduating and it was a dinner and a um, little um, celebration and many most of them are going well they, I think they're all going off to college yeah. or to um, maybe one said he was going into the work workforce right mm -hmm. away um, and then uh, I went to YLC which is youth leading change program safe streets mm -hmm. has and they have a leadership program in uh, our high schools and the students these are students who aren't typically in leadership positions so it's a really good program mm -hmm. that they have right. and they do things anti-drug and uh, anti-drinking and um, driving 
safely programs that they do with all the other students. So I did that. And then today we had the um, parent advisory, superintendent parent advisory breakfast. And I just want to do a shout out to Blix who came in with dances. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Um, and I think we should do more dancing in the school. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually a, sort of a communication uh, thing. The boys and the girls together, you know, a lot of times elementary boys don't like to touch little girls but they were doing the swinging around and actually they were really good and the kids were so, super enthusiastic and I just think it's really good it could be incorporated in PE in a lot of our schools so yeah it did you know yes that's right and, um, stop laughing so I, I thought it was real, I think it's really good and um, folk dancing and things like that and I've t I actually talked to a high uh, a middle school principal who said she taught folk dancing in middle school and the kids actually at mm -hmm. first they're a little bit you know yeah. nervous I, about it and then they get mm -hmm. right into it so yeah, I learned so. Polynesian dance at Jimmy Reed Elementary School did you mm -hmm. did, yeah, it was a big yeah. thing and we did kind of a musical I was way into Greece I remember we were doing Greece so oh, yes fun. and dancing. did you like it I loved it yeah but see sure <laughs> does musicals. I think it connects you with the school yeah. and so Director Leon mm -hmm. any report today uh, just some comments follow up a little bit on some discussion we had last um, um, last security meeting uh, but also a different topic um, thinking about um, success and performance of students that aren't succeeding um, as well and trying to target um, could there be some more involvement from parents that aren't involved um, in their education as much as uh, as much as much as could be helpful Things like, do they know how to get onto the website, uh, check, check grades, do they come to parent-teacher conferences, those type of things. For all students, um, I think uh, also there's, there's some groups that are not doing as well as others, um, like the Latino students sometimes are not rising. The graduation rate hasn't risen as much as all the other groups. They're all rising, but maybe that's still uh, something that's not rising as much. Um, I know that there's some concern from some families about uh, immigration um, agents coming to uh, to pick them up if they're not documented parents um, and that is not nothing that happens in our district but that is something that is thought about by some parents so kind of in this light uh, I'd like to see if there's interest from the school board and uh, administration in trying to reach out to some of these groups of parents um, maybe they're non English speaking parents maybe they're immigrants maybe they're English speaking parents and how they can be done with a community partnership um, maybe one of the obvious ones would be a community in schools um, or other groups. So a little bit maybe discussion uh, could be had about this. And if there are any ideas, I'd love to hear them. I think if our um, partnership office director, Amanda Scott Thomas, were here, she might have a few things to share and to offer. Mm -hmm. But I think um, one of the great things about that team is the focus on or the um, incorporation of that dual capacity building framework as a guiding model for their work. So in focusing both on developing the, uh, helping to build the capacity of families to engage with the school system, but also to build our capacity as a school system to really engage families. So I think what you're, some of what you're getting at is how we reach to and how we engage with families who may not be English speakers or who may have some other hesitation about um, com coming into the building to be engaged in that way. Um, and for and I think that's a great opportunity for us to see and how they engage their in supporting their students at home and for us to build off of that together but I think Amanda and her team might be able to provide some additional context for things that they have in the works and for ways that we can plug holes if there are holes in their strategy strategic plan moving forward I think it's real important too and uh, one of the things that we can do in central administration is really support school based because parents are most likely to engage at their school and so if we can really provide avenues and I think that's what Amanda does well as far as making sure that we really support um, you know parents in their in, in their home school because they tend not to trust us I have no idea why but um, that they but they trust their school and their place so if we can provide more resources more programming and uh, you know provide them with those <laughs> curriculum that they can use at the school I think that's a really that's a good idea a good way to go but I hear you talking about targeted strategies too so I think I'm really digging into what some of those more targeted strategies are. I'm 100% behind that. Some of that so. could mean meeting with some parents and seeing what, what are the barriers and meeting meeting them in the place 
place that they feel safe in, yep. wherever that is, whether it's your school or, or an outside school mm-hmm. community center, center yeah. potentially. I was going to comment. I know that uh, I was talking to Jennifer Cooper today, who's the principal at Blix, and they have the language immersion. And I said, how's your parent um, engagement? And she said, it's really, really, really really good. We've really reached out. And that's a majority of Latino children attending there. And Debbie, that dance, you know, I saw that class last (laughs) year. Not the kids there, but that's part of their cultural. And Sheridan, Lister have cultural events, which are safe and a lot of the things that you're talking about they have a little fair you know and people will come from our from us or from the community and and it's a smaller gathering and you talk with some of the parents and I think if you'll if we have an opportunity to talk with Amanda she can I've seen it work I've seen it work at Sheridan and we had four or five hundred parents come and most of them were non-English speaking and and we had lots of things going on, and most of us were fairly bilingual. I was the old gringo lady whose Spanish is a little bit limited. But at, at what Carla's saying, I think, is the way that we should approach this is from a building-by-building building approach and see what they're doing, because most of the parents know that that school building is safe mm-hmm. when they come in there. And um, at least the ones that I'm still in contact with, and there are a large number of them, and they feel like Blix and Sheridan and Bose and the the schools where they're have maybe sent I mean there are some of the little kids in that Blix class have had four or five siblings, you know, go through the school. So I would I would be inclined to really think about let's do a little bit of a outreach and see exactly what's going on at that building level and see if we can't address some of the issues that you're addressing and do it at that level where for most people, they are comfortable with the Jen Coopers and the other principals there and, and the staff and figure out how we can better address, um, you know, those barriers. And for me, um, Latino community is extremely important, always has been. My youngest son is Latino and I have Latino and Latino grandchildren. So I know some of the barriers that they have faced, even though they were uh, born here still just because of who they are. I think my son was one of only maybe 50 or 60 Latino kids in Tacoma Public Schools and that was not easy so I'm there to help in whatever way I can so what we can do. Our Title I schools have um, a, some money that's specifically mm-hmm. set aside for mm-hmm. parent engagement mm-hmm. and um, it seems to me that that's something that you know as a team we can work on you know, over the summer to really provide some structure and some um, some opportunities and strategies for our schools to use, and then to track it, hold it accountable by you know asking them to report out about what they're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if there's um, if this is something that you know the board and the, your leadership uh, get behind, and maybe we get some targeted um, input from principals in the schools. Maybe they say. Maybe their graduation rates aren't as high for certain groups, and uh, maybe their parent-teacher conference attendance rate is not good in certain groups of, of students. And we could try to bring in some of those some of those parents into maybe an informational session to figure out ways to improve that that connection to to get their grades up and get them to graduate better. If parents are involved. So, thank you. Um, the other question or the other topic, uh, kind of peels back a little bit to our discussion last week on safety um, regarding, uh, I appreciate the comments from our speaker here, um, community person from Planned Parenthood who had experience uh, Mm -hmm. keeping uh, safety and a nurturing environment together. So I think we, uh, there are things that uh, we talked about last week regarding hardening schools. We we mentioned um, if they're too hardened then they look like prisons and kids don't learn in places like that. I don't think we're there, we're not gonna get there. But the other piece of uh, the um, mental stability of students um, and how we assess that, it's being done in many ways. And I'm wondering if there's a, uh, if we could just hear more in future meetings about the coordination of what that looks like. Um, the comments I made last week uh, were before this latest school shooting where there were no red flags in this um, person that murdered people in Texas. Uh, so looking at all students for evaluation of uh, they went wanting to hurt themselves or others um, quick questions that, that could be attended to maybe more than once a year and how that's being attended to by the schools 
Did you folks, I apologize for not being here. Did you folks have a chance to talk a little bit about zones of regulation? Yeah, we did. I'm sorry, what? Zones, zones of, of regulation. regulation. We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we remember we yeah. talked about the zones of oh, the, yeah. Yeah. about one no, of the ways that we asked students to self-report about how they're mm -hmm. feeling, what they're looking like. Yeah, we did talk about that. Okay. 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 Student board members, do you have comments tonight? No. 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 Um, yeah, I also had something about safety. So um, last month at the All City Senate, um, two ladies from the district came and talked to us and we had a discussion about safety. And um, I think students have many concerns this year especially about um, safety and uncertainties and it made us feel really heard and I think that's really important and should continue and even with the younger students they're kind of seeing things and hearing things and um, getting kind of scared and so I think having conversations about them and uh, discovering what's going to make them feel safe is really important and we should continue with that. Thank you. Thank you. One um, more comment. Mm -hmm. So um, something that could uh, really improve safety regarding gun injury would be um, legislation around um, owners of weapons having them locked up and secured that doesn't exist currently um, but uh, until that exists maybe a, the idea of potentially sending a, a robocall or something to parents saying if you have guns in your home please lock them up uh, to remind people 60 percent of weapons in America are not locked up in people's homes and that contributes to the statistic that if you have weapons in your home, you're six times more likely to have them used against you or your loved ones. Um, so that's something for consideration. Can I comment on that? Back in the early 90s, I worked on the Brady Bill with Sarah Brady, and we got that passed, and that assault weapon went away. But one of the things that Mayor Rice and I worked on was, number one, trigger lock, and number two, exactly what you're talking about, locking the guns up. And I would like to see us come back and support with some, a number of our legislators uh, the trigger lock bill and the uh, another bill back. And nobody's had the courage to come back and do that because we had to have the state patrol escort us out after we were at a assault weapons ban and <coughs> rolled all that out because of the, the pushback from the NRA. But I'm certainly not afraid to come back and do that again. And I think we need to, um, particularly from my own personal experience, uh, a year ago, last September, there was a shooting up at Burlington Mall in, Cask in Skagit County. A young man who was mentally ill got an unsecured weapon, walked in there, killed five people. Two of the that were killed were members of our family. So I really personally understand the need the need for that, and I think, you know, we probably need to bring that up at, 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 at with some of our other school partners, maybe not necessarily WASDA, but with some of our larger school districts, urban, suburban school districts, that would be properly on this side of the state be willing to support that kind of legislation. So I have had experience in that, and I am more than willing to be out there again, because when the Brady Bill passed and then was not renewed after it had been in effect, the number of shootings went down because the sale of assault weapons, you know, assault weapons were banned. And we need to go back and do that. And I thank you for bringing that up, and particularly given the situation that will never go away for our family. And that was just an unsecured gun, a rifle that he was able to get out of a closet. And, and there were two issues, the mental health issue and the unsecured gun. But if he hadn't had, the gun had been secured, probably five people would still be here. So thank you. I just have one comment. Um, generally, I haven't been able to get to as many events in the district as I've wanted to in the last month or two <laughs> now, but because, primarily because of work commitments. But fortunately for me, um, my work life overlaps a lot with my um, service on the board. So I was fortunate to be on a panel yesterday um, in Maryland. It was the meeting of the National Coordinating Committee for School Health and Safety. And a large topic among the meeting's membership was focused on mental health and school safety and how we provide supports to students in a, <laughs> and with a focus on prevention to try to um, prevent some of these incidents from happening. So with that in mind, I'm reflecting more on the work that we're doing um, with PBIS and trying to um, with a focus on prevention and creating that 
culture of safety and respectful um, learning environments. And then also the work that we're doing um, with the Wallace, in, with support from the Wallace Foundation with the focus on social emotional learning that really helps students understand um, um, their emotions and engage socially and kind of engage in this very social environment. So I'm really looking forward to where this work is going. But as I sit here and thought about it a little bit longer, I just want to express one point of um, not concern yet, but uh, just to put this out here as a thought in the work that we're doing with Wallace. And I'm, I appreciate the fact that we're leading and helping to build the research and evidence base for um, embedding explicit social emotional instruction um, because there isn't a huge evidence base for it. But in education, we don't have a ton of gold standards, random controlled trial kind of studies with good comparison groups, in part because it's really ex expensive, but also because of the ethical issues around not providing students access to something mm -hmm. that you know is beneficial while you provide it in another context. Okay. So I'm really, um, I um, want to be sensitive to the timeline, the length of our partnership, and sensitive to watching the early outcomes that we see. And I recognize, too, that implementation takes time. So three years is really not that long. But I really want to be sensitive to watching those outcomes. And if we see really strong evidence that what we're doing um, with the control schools or with the pilot schools is really working, like thinking about that year three timeline and what it looks like and what that rollout mm -hmm. to the other schools looks like because if we see strong evidence that it's having an impact and really making a difference in the pilot schools, I would hate to wait longer as long as we planned to roll that out. But that's just my one caution around the work as it rolls out. So, okay. so just real quickly, um, the Wallace Grant um, is, is targeted at 12 schools, six pilot, six comparison sites. Um, one of the reasons we were selected was the work in the Tacoma Whole Child Initiative, which is around culture and climate. Uh, and there are some uh, different pieces around there. Um, we don't have to stop that work. We made it very clear we were not going to stop that work. Um, and so uh, this doesn't limit. What they'll be looking for is, is um, how does this extra boost uh, in alignment between after school, as well as some of the more targeted things that we're going to increase as our Tacoma plan that we're designing, has an impact, but it's not to say that we, uh, because this was a deal breaker as far as the staff was concerned, we weren't going to stop the Tacoma Whole Child Initiative work. And it doesn't mean that even schools that are in the um, comparison sites um, can't do additional things. Um, and so it is just uh, the research studies around some very specific components, but it's really designed to build a plan that can go out and be expanded. So think of it also as rocket fuel. Um, what are these cities doing that's working well? How do we boost that and see what the business plan is uh, in order to expand? And including the fourth year of the grant is designed where cities are eligible for funding to bring whatever those comparison sites up to, are to speed as well as build that system out. And so okay. um, the board is there. And some good that's news is as we, when we looked at our results in Tacoma, uh, and compared to, they measure social emotional skills of students. They measure all kinds of things. But the most important one for us was social emotional skills. We're not competitive, but our Tacoma kids have it. Have it. <laughs> and and that doesn't mean. And one of the things that I would just caution is there is not a perfect silver bullet for any of this. Um, when we're dealing with culture and climate, uh, we will always be. Um, constantly working at how do we improve what are the latest needs um, how do we respond to those needs this is very dynamic it's dynamic from a, um, a developmental level it's de dynamic from a societal issue um, so I also want to be very clear this work will never go away as long as we value it and even at that um, the board made it very clear when they adopted the strategic plan the strategic plan goals is that those plans needed to be dynamic all this to say is, is we have not arrived. Superintendent Sartin uh, uh, has reminded us that. And uh, we will never really arrive. We will need, it's a continuous improvement cycle. And that's was very critical when the board established that plan is to also establish a philosophy about continuous improvement. So as we bring you reports, as we bring you next steps, as we bring you samples, 
those are not to say that that is the be all end all and that we're done, but that's the next phase of our continuous improvement, including things like how do we put kiosks in the community so that parents have different access to information. Mm -hmm. And so we sometimes need pi time to pilot some of those to make sure that work out the legal situations, work out the access situations. But there's a number of things that are in the hopper that the yeah. superintendent is, that we may not be ready to quite release uh, for public affair, uh, but um, even including today, Carla, you know, what's next, what's next? And I did see one of those kiosks. Well, I was told, I saw a picture of one of those kiosks in the community, so I'm excited for that too. And it's really important that we also are able to make sure that they're functional before yeah. we just go out there because that's the downside of we just throw something out there, we put some positive PR around it, and then it's not functional, and then people are more frustrated. Mm -hmm. And so we're really trying to do our due diligence of trying to figure out is the business model, what's the support, and that can be frustrating because it's not always as fast as we want to go, not as fast as you want to go, not as fast as the community wants to go. Um, but this is, uh, this is really important work. Um, and it's, it's work that is always going to be a part of our, if we truly believe in every student every day, it's always going to be a part of our work. And so we'll never truly arrive and be, well, oh, we're done with the whole child. And when we think we do that, then everything falls apart. Yeah based on my experience, I can tell you that. And it's also really frustrating because sometimes folks want to say, well, just tell me the answer. Well, the answer is, is a value system, and the answer is a belief system, and continuously uh, improving to ensure that they're safe, engaged, challenged, supported, healthy. And so we, we will continue to work in there. Thank you. So with that, unless there's any other comments, we will move on to item 16, announcement of future. Oh, student they did. Didn't get to code oh, red. no, they did. He said he didn't oh, have yeah, a report. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. I, did. I just yes, forgot you. I was a little off earlier, but I got it together for the end. Okay, <laughs> item 16, announcement of future board meetings, Thursday, June 7, 2018. We will meet at 6 p.m. for an executive session to talk about its, the superintendent's evaluation. Thursday, June 14th, 2018, we will meet at 6 p.m. for our regular business meeting. Item 17, executive session. There is no executive session tonight. And item 18, with that, we are adjourned. So that, um, no.